Hello and welcome to the Webflail podcast. This is episode 98 of Webflail. I'm your host, Jack, your failure connoisseur. And today my guest is Vimalam Vidjaskeren. I fucked that, didn't I? <laughs> That's correct. The founder of Vid Designs, Webflow agency that's been in the game for three years. They've successfully completed over 200 Webflow projects, partnering with top global brands such as Red Bull, Tony Blair Institute, London Interdisciplinary School, Compose, Eliso Institute. There are so many different brands on his website. Go check out the case studies after listening to this episode, obviously. But in 2022, they expanded their horizons by venturing into product development. Since then, they have built six different tools. You've probably used some of these, formerly Flowplay, VDS Chrome extension, Flowpilot, and most recently, Bulk SEO. So that's literally just come out. So this is, this is hot off the press. We'll be talking about that after we've done the intro. But has it always been smooth sailing? Of course it hasn't. The failures that we'll talk about in today's episode are hiring the wrong people slash unable to delegate interesting a client horror story and taking too long to understand that retainers aren't that bad oof vim welcome to the webflow podcast hey jack happy to be here i've always wanted to be on it and so i'm finally glad to be part of 98 as well so that's it 98 yes yeah i'm really glad that you are part of this and you should definitely have been part of this way early we've tried to do it (laughs) broke my arm cancelled this that and the other i feel like i've i know you it's almost like we've already done this episode because you obviously did your talk at the uh, london meetup and then i've i've uh also just like seen you online so much so i'm like of course he's done one of course but then it's like no we need to get him on and ask him about his deepest darkest secrets before we do that though can i ask you what your relationship is with failure oh man that's a deep Hey, we're going straight in. We're going straight in here (laughs) to be honest i actually can't handle failure really well i absolutely hate failing and i touch it so far in my life haven't had that big of a failure the worst i had was like failing some exams and stuff like that Um, but it's it's definitely like i think a feature of mine that i that i hate is i just the feeling is just bad i try to avoid failure and up until recently i avoid doing things if i know i'm gonna fail or if i'm not gonna succeed so i'll just completely stop doing that or turn that off or don't even think about it but i think once you start freelancing or once you start doing your own thing in depth you you will fail in certain things um, but that helped me sort of like sort of reframe how I look at failure. The main changing point was in uni. So I think one of the quote unquote biggest failure was I almost failed the whole year of my second year of uni because I couldn't pass my programming test. That was like a core part of the course. It was too difficult and I know I was going to fail. So I didn't study for it. So I was just hoping I'll just, you know, scrape by, I'll just do something just get the 40% I need and get on. I didn't. And I was like, okay, shit. And that gave me like so much anxiety. I'm like, before that, I never really had that sort of experience. Plus being here in the UK, coming from Malaysia, it's like, shit, what do I do if I fail uni, right? Like I can't go back. What do I do? Redo my year. So that whole thing was just running in my mind. But because I was pushed to the point where I need to get it done, it almost changed the way I looked at it. So I then started actually learning about it because the worst thing happened could happen already happened i failed there's nothing more nothing worse that could happen so then that eased the pressure i picked up programming i I finally understood how the shit works and then yeah after that it's almost like any failure is almost like okay that's fine i just learned from it more it's not the end of the world like i used to believe it was interesting okay so it sounds like you've kind of reframed failure as you've gone on after that and quite a formative experience at quite a young age to have, you know, like what may be deemed like success in your parents' eyes, I'd imagine. Yeah. Like, you know, uni is like, oh my God, like it's you okay. have to do that. You're never going to get a job. Yeah. You're never going to do this, yeah. that and the other. Like, it's like such a big deal in their in yeah. their eyes, maybe. So to yeah. have that experience and then be like, okay, now I'm just going to like take life into my own hands a bit because if you can't pass like what is formally deemed as like success. Yeah. Then it sounds like you kind of were just like, fuck it. I'm just going to do this. Like, yeah, like there's no other choice. Right. And 
because I know some people like I had the privilege of not worrying about all those stuff like personally I didn't it was a very boring childhood it was very typical just go to school get your grades come home that sort of thing there was not any major sort of life-changing failures or anything like that so like the worst I could think of up until the point was just failing the exam and like worst case you know I redo the year but just the, the fact that I had to do that and like tell my parents that and ask them to pay for another year like that was the worst thing that could happen to me up until that point but yeah so then it just reframed all the things how I saw things and it was a good life lesson before you know I think if you don't have failure and you keep going life without seeing that failure it you almost spiral out of control when it comes later in life so I could only imagine if something like that happens when I'm I'm like 30 like if up until that point I've not had anything like that I could just imagine how I could just spiral down into like a very dark place yeah and have that formative experience young has been has yeah. been helpful i found yeah. this crazy tweet that you did well not crazy in a bad way just it was really interesting you said if you told this 22 year old me that i'd have my own little agency with a fantastic five person team partner with incredible clients and manage four products all built on webflow i'd say you're nuts why would you say that's nuts because believe it or not i never had a goal so when people ask me in uni what do you want to do after uni i just say i don't know i and that's been like since young, when people ask me in school, what do you want to be when you grow up? I just say, I don't know. I was very comfortable in saying that because there's no point of like saying I want to be a doctor or an engineer because I know that I don't know what I need to do there. Yeah, so 22, I was still unsure what, what I was going to do, where I was going to be. I just knew like, okay, I just didn't finish uni. I'll figure that shit out once I finished. So if you go back to like 22 year old me that I'll be doing my own business. Up until that point, I've never thought about it. I know at some point I will be doing something on my own. The whole web flow thing wasn't part of my life. The whole coding thing wasn't part of my life. Nothing about what I'm doing now existed like four years ago. Yeah, it's just like I would not have believed myself. Um, I had no goals, no dreams or anything like that. I just wanted to finish uni and then figure out, probably get a job. That was the furthest I could think was just, I'll get a job at like an engineering company. No idea what I was doing. No idea what role I was going to do. So that is why I feel like, Every year, you tell me last year, me, that I'm going to be doing something like this this year. I still don't believe you. It's going to happen next year as well. That's not really a goal or an idea that I, that I work with. It's just go with the flow. But that's awesome. I think like it's a really cool idea to, to look back at you, know, you six months ago or a year ago and think, what an idiot. If only I'd known then what I knew now. And I think that's really healthy. That's someone that's really striving to to grow, develop, learn. And that comes with its own downsides, I'm sure. But I do think that it's it's great to, you know, look back and think, God, I was such an idiot. Like I'm, you know, grow and, and learn and develop and think, you know, I'm yeah. I'm really moving fast in in the direction that you're going. And speaking of then, so I mean, you left uni. I checked out your LinkedIn and You've got, you know, you're a Webflow developer at FinSuite, then Webflow developer at Code and Wonder, then freelance Webflow developer. So you went freelance and then that seems to be where Fid Designs kind of started, where you outgrew, you know, the freelance work that you were doing. You were like, okay, I, you know, I've got a lot of work coming in and now I need to start thinking about a team. Can you, in your own words, maybe like let us understand where you went from 22, you just graduated finally and your parents are like, yes, now you're going to go and get a job. You're going to go make us proud. And you were like, yeah, maybe not in the way you think. Talk to me about that. So while in my third year of uni, that was like when I was 22, I figured out Webflow, I was playing around with it. And I really liked it. Like I really enjoyed the whole thing. Up until that point, there's nothing creative that I could do. I'm not a very creative person. I can't draw, no art skills, no music skills, zero. But something like web design is quite easy to pick up and being someone that I've been on the internet for so many, so many years, I know what good design is. So very quickly, I was able to, even if you look at my very first design, I, would, I wouldn't call it bad. Uh, it's cringe, but it's not like starting from zero. I had like quite a lot of knowledge of design. So when I was building around or playing with like projects for myself, my friends, um, and then finally I got that one client. That was the first time someone was paying me for a work that I was doing. That was a very it still is a very, very intensive high. I just felt like, oh shit, is this so cool? And that being creative work as well was even more exciting because I'm, again, with creative work, you're always learning. You're always trying to improve yourself. So I was just doing that on my side while I was finishing up uni. 
I knew very quickly, like, okay, this is what I want to do because it's very engaging. I didn't have the mood to even apply for jobs or think about working for someone else. Like, I just really liked this. But I did. I didn't know how to tell my parents. Asian parents, you go to uni, you get a job, and that's it. Like, that's that's the path that you have to career take. ladder. That you just, yes, you basically. just try and get a raise and try and get to the boss. Is that kind yeah. Of, yeah? Or you work at like some big top four companies and you yeah that's that was their idea as well i was naive because i felt like because my dad does his own business my granddad did his own business i assumed he'll be fine with it um i assumed he'll be like okay yeah go try it really stupid but uh when i when i was trying to tell him like this is what i want to do he didn't say no but he has this way of saying like mm, maybe you should focus on like getting a job like oh give me your cv i'll get you a job like it, it's not like discouraging you but it's also not encouraging so that put me in like this weird place of like, should I do it or should I not do it? And as as soon as I graduated, that conversation got even more intense. Every call, he's just like, are you getting a job? Are you applying for a job? Give me a CV. I'll get you a job. And that added this pressure of like, okay, maybe he is onto something, which is why I started looking for a job, at least within the space, like as a Webflow developer or a designer, which is why I joined Code and Wonder. I think at the point, I just wanted to tell myself, okay, worst case, I can still get a job. Um, I just wanted to see how it is, put myself off the pressure of like, I need to support myself now. And I just couldn't sleep after that point. I was like, okay, this is getting too much. I, I worked with Code and Wonder for about six months. While I was doing that, I was also working with FinSuite. I think about for like six months um, as well on the side. And then I was also working as a freelance developer for HLabs. So it's just like four or five jobs. I was just doing all of this. And then I think at one point I was just like, okay, this is too much. I want to see what's the worst case that can happen if I do it myself. That's when I just quit all of that and just went on freelance. My point was like, I'm going to do this for a year. See if it's going to work. See if I can make the same amount of money I was making with the jobs. If I do, I'll continue. If not, I'll go back to another job or something like that. Like that's the worst case scenario. But then luckily enough, that kept on growing. Okay, wait, 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 wait. So I think we just need to double click on something. You worked for Code and Wonder, FinSuite, and H Labs all simultaneously. About the same time, yeah. Wow, that's wild. And I mean, I just think this is important to highlight because a lot of people try and freelance out the gate without having any agency yeah. experience. And I think a lot of people in the Webflow space are excited by the idea of working online, working remotely, you know, working with whoever they want, earning whatever they want. Yes. All of that stuff sounds great, but actually freelancing, being a freelancer, you might not think of it as a business, but you need to know how to manage a lot of different stuff which a successful agency is already doing. That's how they yeah. can hire multiple different people. So if you go and join an agency, it's such an incredible way to actually kick off your freelance career. It gives you that safety net. You actually yeah. learn with people that are way more experienced than you. You learn about all the different parts of what you will need to be able to do as a freelancer, you know, accountancy, yeah. sales, marketing, like all of those different parts that you might not think about when you're just like getting into Webflow and playing around with the tool. Like that is yeah. not freelancing. Freelancing is getting paid to do yeah. the thing and managing clients and all of that stuff. So I think it's so interesting that you work with three different agencies all simultaneously, all probably like you were observing what they were doing, what's working, what's not working in this agency. And then you yeah. kind of brought all that into your own practice, which I think is incredible. What was yeah, the biggest because, lessons that you learned there at those different places? Yeah, I think the only reason like I wanted to like work with all these companies is mainly because I just wanted to learn. And to be fair, I did have the privilege of not going to the job. Like, I didn't have to pay rent or anything like that. I was still living with my mom and dad. So I knew like the worst case scenario is I will still make some money, but not as much money. But once I, I had to move out, I had to start thinking about, okay, I need to pay rent. I need to pay for like my food and all that, all that stuff. So that's why I was like, okay, you know what? Let's try to get a job, try to sustain my lifestyle with the job. And then, you know, freelance could be on the side. Um, I don't want to put too much pressure on myself trying to get every project like that. That's very stressful. And when somebody has like family or like a mortgage, I just can't imagine how like that, that would kill me. <laughs> that, that's such so much pressure. But I was like 22, 20, yeah, 22. Um, I was like, you know what, what the heck? I have all the time. I was living alone. Um, so I had all of my evenings, all of my mornings and my afternoons to just work. So I used to work for like Code and Wonder in the morning up until like five. And then I, I switched to like FinSuite. Um, I worked for them for like a couple of hours. 
And then the night I do my own thing, which is like the V-Designs thing. So it's always like trying to balance all of this. I enjoyed it. I learned a lot. Mainly it's just like how they manage projects, how they communicate um, with clients. Like Alicia is, is a great communicator. Like I will be on a call with her and another client and just see her sell and like try to communicate and like just talk to the client like a friend. Um, that's a skill I didn't have up to that point. My point was like, go to the call, get the deal, like try to get them closed. Like I, I get sweaty trying to speak to the clients, but she's so chill. She, she laughs, she's making jokes. And then Joe, I think he's so calm. When I was working with them, they had like 50 people and he still had time to like reply to like some of like my dumbest questions. He's always on like Slack DMs and the way he explains things, like he, he just showed me how someone should speak and like how a leader should speak and, and that's something i learned um, while there i met jay who again is a really good salesman how he communicates with the clients again over slack is something i didn't know to do um, how he manages the expectations and like even pushes back on certain things so again stuff like that i would not have learned if i was just doing it myself or might have you know taken me so much time by the time i learned it it'd be a bit too late i would have lost a lot of opportunity hedge labs hannah Again, she's a really good salesperson. I wish I had her energy levels. Yeah, she she could sell anything to anyone. She's so good at it. Yeah, just working with all these people, meeting other people from the team that I would not have ever met because most of them aren't on like Twitter, aren't on LinkedIn. So at least if I need something, I do know who I can talk to. Uh, it, was just, it was very fun working for all these agencies. Interesting that a lot of the skills that you talked about there were like soft skills. You know, there's there's like... The hard skill of like, okay, you're obviously yeah. getting better at the tool Webflow because that's, you know, you're building the websites and whatever, but actually it's like the client communication, the project management, the selling, the pushing back when, you know, there's requests that actually maybe are outside of the scope or whatever. That, those types of skills are really interesting. So you've now got seven people working for you. You've done over 200 projects. You've worked with clients like Red Bull, et cetera. Are you now the salesman? Do you consider yourself, like in terms of how your role has changed, I mean, you were just a clueless 22-year-old going out on your own. And then you've now, three years later, we've got all sorts going on. But is now your role in your head like the salesman? Yeah, it's at this point, I'm like four different caps. So I'm the salesman. I pretty much do all of the lead generation, speaking to them, emailing back and forth, proposals, selling different things. I also do a lot of management because with people comes things that you've got to tell them to do, feedback on things. And yeah, that I didn't expect that. I just thought I'll get the project, give it to them and forget about it. But it doesn't work like that. You've got to check in, you've got to set timelines. you got to manage the client's expectation as well. So that is something I'm still learning. I still delve into a little bit of design and workflow, usually when resource is tight or I just couldn't find anybody that I can work with within a time frame. So I just pick it up quickly, just try to finish it. I need to stop doing that because I'm no longer the best person anymore. It's a bit rusty, but I can still get it done. And then I'm also like doing all the finance stuff, just trying to make sure we're not going into a loss, making sure all the projects are profitable and stuff like that. And hiring. Yeah. I mean, you're juggling a lot. Sorry, I oversimplified your job role. And I was like, <laughs> do you see yourself as a salesman? It's like, uh, yeah, Jack. And like five other things that are really, really important and probably equally um, eating up your time day to day. Where is Vid Designs going? Like you're an enterprise partner now. You've worked with all these different clients, like I said. What is your zenith? Where are you trying to get to? I don't know. <laughs> That's beautiful. I think <laughs> we started like two years ago, closing into the third year in like sometime October. My first year, I just wanted to survive. As I said, I just wanted to know that I can make money and just feed myself and, and live. I did that. And then second year, I think that was what sort of a little bit of my failure. Like I got a bit too cocky. I hit my financial goal and I was like, okay, I'm unstoppable now. Let's you know, try to grow the company. So I started hiring the wrong people, trying to balance a bit too much, lost focus on what I wanted to do. Uh, we still grew, but it wasn't a great growth. It wasn't something I was ha very happy with. 30 has been really great so far. And I think from now on, it's just trying to grow the company a little bit, hiring a little bit more people because I feel at this point I'm overworked. I'm just pulling a lot of things together. Um, so I need to learn how to delegate things, uh, which is still the hardest thing to do. Uh, but yeah, I think after this is trying to grow the company in a little bit more sustainable way. Amazing. Okay, we are encroaching on the failures. So let's just dive straight in, shall we? Tell me about failure number one, hiring the wrong people slash unable to 
delegate. Yeah. So this one, I think pretty much any agency owner, this is probably like the biggest failure. Hiring is the hardest thing to do. It's like the chicken and egg problem. Do you hire when you have the work or do you hire first and then go find the work to give it to them? So it's, I still don't know what the answer is for that. But what I did is I get the work and then I try to go find someone to work with, which is a terrible thing to do because I don't have the time to properly qualify them. So it's almost like, okay, their, their work looks decent enough. I'll just give it to them and then I'll pick up the slack if you don't have to take slack off. So that led to me hiring someone that, that wasn't really good. Um, I was paying them good money, but I think at that point I didn't do my due diligence enough. I just went for like the easiest option that I had. And the biggest failure was they weren't hitting the deadlines or the tasks that we were setting. They were quite slow. Um, again, I, I don't know whether that's maybe because I move a little bit faster on my flow, um, but retrospectively, it was very slow. And it gave me that anxiety of like, are they doing the job? Or like, I have to constantly go and check whether they're finishing it up or are they stuck or anything like that. I thought that was normal. Um, I'm like, well, this is what people are dealing with every day. Um, until I told my, my now wife, I just told her like, I'm dealing with this person. And is this normal? She's like, no. Like someone, if you hire, they should be able to do the work themselves and they come back to you if they can't and if you're looking for a solution but you shouldn't be needing to check in with them every day or they shouldn't give you the anxiety of are they doing enough work am i paying for nothing like that was the feeling i had luckily enough i caught it on a little bit early on and it wasn't a full-time role it was like a contract role so it was easy to let them go but yeah i could imagine how that would have been a big issue if it was a full-time role I mean, I'm committed to that person on like a much longer contract. So after that, every person that we bring in, I try to make sure, be very clear in what I want and just setting some ground rules or like, you know, you should, how, how often should you give us updates? Setting deadlines is something that I didn't used to do because I didn't like that when I was working, but I understand it now. Like it just helps everyone work to something. Otherwise the task will just take as long as it takes. But yeah, just a lot of learnings, a lot of SOPs set in place just to make sure we avoid doing this at a, at a much larger scale. Okay, wait, backtrack. So the chicken and egg problem, really interesting thing that you started talking about there. So do you hire for you know the amount of work that's coming in or do you have people ready so that when you do have work coming in, they are, you know, ready to go to a certain extent. And something that I learned from Dan and Tim from Make Build Studio, they talked about when they find a freelancer that they really love, they will just book them. They'll be like, okay, we're gonna we're gonna find some we we want you for three months. Can we book you for three months? I spoke to them as well and they said this and that clicked. And that's how I got like our most recent full-time hire was true like that. I just wanted to work with him. I had one small job. I was like, screw it, let's just join us for like three months for like, you know, maybe part-time or something like that. But then quickly we realized once I have that person, every job that comes in, I just go back to him and be like, hey, look, we have extra work. Do you, can you give us more hours? Almost every two weeks, we kept increasing the hours. It went from like 15 to 20 to 25, 30. And now it's like just full-time. Um, and and, and yeah, both of them, that, that was a killer killer tip from both of them great and then that goes on to what you were just talking about so you have freelancers but then yeah. or contractors and obviously the risk of of taking on someone full-time is that you know you're kind of fully responsible for them like yeah. you know regardless of you know work that comes in or not like you're paying them a set amount yeah. each month but on the flip side the advantage of that is obviously that they are you know kind of fully available and you you can rely on them to actually get the job done and and you know you can actually build a bit more of a company culture i'd imagine as well that sounds like yeah. another quite big advantage can you talk yeah. to me a little bit about the structure of the agency now you've got seven people working for you but are some of them contractors some of them full-time or how is that looking we have four full-time team members and then maybe about another four to five freelancers those are like on contracts on like a project basis and the other four like on a full-time basis where they two of them are product developers so one works on formly and Flowplay, the other one works on like webflow apps and other things and then i have a manager who sort of helps me pick tasks that i just don't have the time to do or check in with me sort of a general manager sort of role 
slash project managers somewhere in between interesting okay can i ask you about you know let's say an agency owner yeah. like a very young agency owner is listening right now yeah. and you know you've kind of learned the lessons of like who to hire when to hire them a little bit and i know that you're still learning that as you grow but what would be like the most underrated but most important tip you can give them when it comes to hiring and who they should hire and how that structure should work i think for generally if you're hiring someone you need to be confident that you can pay them so start off with contracts as you said like three month contract or even a, a monthly contract like a freelancer give it so that you're not bound to to just keep paying them you know even if you have no work that you don't want that amount of responsibility so be honest with them uh, which is why i did i just told them like at this point i'm not sure whether i can you know give you a full-time role but join us on like a contract basis or uh, like a freelance basis for x number of hours every month and then we can sort of see how that goes. The first hire that I made was the product developer um, who works on Formly and Flowplay. It was almost similar to what Tim and Dan mentioned. It's just that I liked working with him um, and we were working on like all these different ideas and like JavaScript tools. My point was like, okay, I'll just hire him for like a you know six month contract. I think that's what we spoke about. I can use him for client work. So anything JavaScript related or anything that's technical, he can work on that. I can do like the design and web flow stuff. And then once you have that person in, your brain starts thinking differently. Okay, now I don't have to negotiate prices or anything like that. I'm just going to be like, okay, this is a task. Can you do it? Or this is an idea that I have. And that's how Formly was born. It was just like, I had him full time at that point. I was like, hey, look, I had this idea a long time ago. Can we try to build something quick for like this client? And then that sort of spiraled out into its own product. And because the product makes money, that sort of pays for itself, essentially. So that there's no sort of a risk for me or like it's not costing me technically. As long as the product sells, he still gets his pay. It's all good in that end. The sort of first non, I don't know how to call it, but it's not directly related to a sale or directly related to a project is the manager. Again, I was very honest with her um, is that I didn't know what a manager role was but I needed one. Like at that point, I was just swamped with so many things to do and a lot of things were just slipping out of hand and getting lost. I was losing track of emails and follow-ups and stuff like that. She applied for a web designer role because that, I thought that's what I needed. Okay, you know what? I'll delegate design and then I can focus on the other thing. And then while speaking to her, my brain just changed. I was like, you know what? I need a manager. So I just told her, I was like, you know what? I'm sorry, I can't go through with the... Um, offer because I'm looking for a manager uh, and she was again open with me as just saying like let me work with you I want to learn how that works as well uh, I have no experience in management but if you can teach me I'm happy to learn and sort of pick up um, from you and I was like okay that sounds like a fair deal both of us are learning she's happy to, to <laughs> both of us are very, this. <laughs> very yeah I was just very lucky like she was interested in like at least working for us so yeah the first few months was just trying to offload everything that I do if you're working for yourself you have a tendency of like you know, I'll just do it myself. It's going to take me five minutes. That's going to be t 10 minutes. But you forget, like, it's going to take you 10 minutes, like 10 times in the, the next 10 days. So it adds up, the hours adds up. But if you just tell someone, it's going to take me 20 minutes to tell her, but I don't have to do it again. I, I'll just let her deal with it after that. Um, so it starts off like that, like, hey, I need to send an invoice to this person. This is how I do it. Can you handle it? Once, twice after that, she's pretty much handles the whole invoicing, that sort of things emails so i'll just let her know like please go through like my inbox mark anything that i need to review follow up with you know all the proposals that we send because i didn't used to do that but just following up three four times five times helps because most of the time it just gets lost um, so she does most of that team management before she joined i didn't have any structure on notion or anything like that um, so she helped set up sops boards dashboards and stuff like that initially just felt a bit like why do we need this but now i just cannot go without notion i have to open it all the client information is there all the project information is there yeah i think for me i just knew what i wanted i didn't know how i was going to get there but i just needed someone to work with me so it's very very important just to find someone that is sort of aligned with you and wants to work with you and wants uh, to learn as well yeah that, that's the the catch because uh, just need good people <laughs> and also like it's incredible that she was you know, applying for a web design job because she obviously understands the world of Webflow, yeah. which I think is a massive difference between, you know, a PM that's like a very good organizational person, but then also yeah. can talk the same language as designers and developers, but also, you know, talk to clients about problems that 
you know, maybe they can answer off the bat yeah. rather than have to go to the design and development team and then back to the client. So yeah. that's really, really cool. Okay, I feel like young agency owners can learn so much from that little segment alone. So it sounds like in summary, don't necessarily hire full-time off the bat. You need to actually be really transparent that maybe you don't have consistency of income coming in because otherwise you'll just, you know, you'll yeah. be you'll be caught with your pants down and yeah. that would just be awful because you've just pissed off someone that could have been maybe a full-timer down the line yeah. who's going to exactly. be working with you. And then yeah. also I think something that I found really interesting that you said is like, essentially, if you can do it quicker than someone that you're hiring, you're just thinking about that one initial like problem being solved in the immediate but actually imagine that you know spiraling out of control and that one email that you send to a client with a follow-up that you could send in a minute but you might have to explain in 10 to pm actually you're going to need to follow up multiple times and like you're going to be needing to do that with five clients or whatever and it's like actually you know don't just think about the immediate but also that long-term time and effort and energy gain through whoever you're teaching as a hire okay tell me about failure number two client horror story failing to scope the project properly and set expectations i'm already getting sweaty (laughs) <laughs> I think that is probably the worst experience that I had. So to set some context is that last year around July-ish was a very quiet time. Um, so there was not a lot of projects coming in. And then as usual, as any freelance or any business owner, you start to panic. Uh, you start accepting, just lowering your prices and just you just want that project. Even though I didn't need it, like to be very honest, we were still fine. We still had cash. We don't need it, but it's just that your brain just can't go without work. Or like, oh, what if this is the end? Uh, you know, that sort of thing comes up. Um, so that this sort of project came through at that time where I was just very kind of desperate of like, I just need to close it. I don't care what I need to do. I'll just close it. So when they were presenting the project, they had it all designed and everything. Um, and we just needed to develop it. It was a very complex project. It's like a lot of animations and stuff like that. Technically, it was possible, but we... I didn't have the time, nor I I just wanted to close it. I didn't do the proper due diligence of like explaining the pros and cons of the method that we were going to do, how long it's going to take, and then ask them when do they need it by. Again, there was a lot of areas that was left unfilled. Uh, I just felt like, okay, I'll just do it. Shouldn't be too difficult. Initially, it was all great. It started off really, really good. We were almost done with the project, less than the time that we quoted for Create News. But the moment they started QAing it on different browsers, especially Safari, shit started to hit. And it, Lotties don't work with Safari. And that's something that I knew, but I forgot. Or I just felt like, okay, maybe that might not be a huge thing because who the hell uses Safari? Um, but I forgot the fact that most mobile traffic is from Safari, at least in the UK. And you know, if they're testing it on mobile, most likely it's on Safari. And Lotties just chug. They, they just absolutely do not work. Um, and then we were in a pickle and now we're like, shit, okay, I one, I didn't tell them this. And they were in this idea of, okay, it's, it's all going to be smooth across. So on Chrome, it's completely fine. There's no issues. But when it came to mobile and yeah, mobile is just terrible. And then they were testing it on Safari, Firefox, and all these other browsers. And it just completely breaks on all these browsers. And then we were stuck in this point of like, okay, now what do we do? We had to explain, like, the issue is not us, but this Lottie is just not supported in these browsers. We had to tell them, like, you want it done in, like, X number of weeks. We can't, you know, realistically, we can't QA on all different browsers, all different devices. We had to be very realistic on who are we speaking to. Um, so most of the traffic we, we estimate is going to come from Chrome and desktop. So let's focus on that. Phase two, we can, you know, try on mobile responsiveness. They weren't buying it. They were like, nope, I want it like done in like a week on all those browsers. But yeah, that was a lot of like tension, like in the call with them was just very stressful trying to explain all of it. And then they'll check in with us. I think every couple of hours, like, oh, where is it at? What's what's the status? And they started to panic, which then makes it even worse because now you start to resent them. Um, (laughs) So yeah, I think uh, towards the end of the project, we just knew like they're not going to come back. Um, and we didn't want to work on it anymore. But yeah, I think that that was like the biggest failure in terms of like project management. Just after that, it's just like trying to explain, be very clear with them with what the scope is, what's the timeline. And also every project has a con. There's no pro- no project that's perfect. Trying to explain it to them and see whether it's a big, 
it might not be big to me, like Safari. Who the hell uses Safari? But for them, it could be a huge thing. Maybe they are target audience are old people on Mac OS or something like that. <laughs> so it, it got to be very clear on, yeah, this is what's important to them at least. Um, so you just sort of don't, yeah, that's just terrible, terrible. It sounds experience. like there was also like working out what's a good fit for you guys because also, you know, a heavily animated site, maybe that time wasn't necessarily in your wheelhouse as as much as like we do WordPress to Webflow CMS migrations really, really well. And we're really confident that we can do that without you losing loads of search traffic. We can make sure that the URL structure is the same. And, you know, that's something that I think a lot of people underestimate. They just say, I'm a Webflower. And then they get thrown yeah. like, hey, we want to do a web app. And can you do like, yeah. we want Webflow yeah. to be the front end. Can you do it? It's like... Okay, well, we're just going to roll up can. our sleeves. Yeah, I've done a yeah. quick Google, and it turns yeah. out you can. So I'm going to say yes to this project and just charge a premium and hope for the best. And it's like, yeah, just take it, a literally beat. take exactly. a beat because and and I think you do realize like what projects you actually want to do in yeah. Webflow because otherwise you're kind of just this like Webflow whore. Definitely yeah, shouldn't have just, said that. But yeah, yeah, you know, that type of like, I'll just take anything Webflow. And yeah. actually, you are not the best person to do that project necessarily for that client. And it's exactly. way better to just be like, you know what, guys, I, I recommend refocus for this yeah. one because these exactly. guys are killer 3D design. And I think they're the best bet or whatever. I mean, do you resonate with that advice? How do you feel about what I've just said? I think... In terms of technical wise, like we we could do it. Like we did deliver, and it was fine. It was all it was it was okay. It wasn't a bad site. But I think where it took a hit was unrealistic timelines. Um, when they said like four weeks, I should have said no. Like that is too short for something this complex. But I didn't. I just wanted that project, so I just charged a premium and took it on. Yeah, just I think what you said is also valid because I've also been there. Of like, oh, let's build a client comes with like, I need to build a directory with, you know, a thousand CMS items. I wanted to pull in from Airtable, all that good stuff. Technically, yes, I've seen it. I've done a small version of it, but if you have like a thousand things, there's no way you could use Zapier and, and sync it. And then that was very early on. I realized, okay, that's not something I want to do. Um, the whole web web stuff side is too complex and I don't really enjoy that part. It's too easy to break, especially if it's like a platform or something that directly generates revenue. I was just not comfortable with it. So we don't do any web apps. So kind of uh, your point is valid. Like you, you should know what you're good at and what you shouldn't be doing. Sort of niching down essentially within the Webflow space. My failure was just not setting real estate expectation, sort of managing it properly. Can I ask you about that then in terms of, you know, let's say someone's listening to this and they're like, I'm a Webflower. Isn't that enough? Isn't that niche down enough? Like, do you have an ideal client that comes to you? Because it seems like initially you were just doing a ton Amazing. of projects, yeah. a ton. Like you've got, yeah. you've got 200 different projects that you've, that you've worked on. But then I noticed on your website, it says, we only take on six Webflow projects every quarter to ensure the highest quality of yeah. work. And the work that you're showing on your homepage, it's not necessarily like we do everything it's it's a very clean design style you've got yeah. um you know a financial management website for the first portfolio piece that you're showing on the homepage. so can you tell me a little bit about like how you're thinking about the ideal client that comes to you you know I see, I see on your website, it's like 10 to 20K is like your sweet spot. Can you tell me a little bit about how you're thinking about that as the salesman, among many other things in your agency? I think starting out, my idea was like, I'm just going to take everything in. And I, I still think if you're still new to the Webflow space, that's a good way to do it because you realize what you like, what you don't like. Um, So at, at one point, anything, I'll just do it. If it's Webflow or web apps, done, I'll do it. E-commerce, I'll do it. If it's just the marketing side, I'll do it. Um, I learned quite a lot. So that's that's how you can sort of expand your horizon a little bit. That's how I knew about Airtable, how I knew about Zapier, how I knew about the Noble uh, FinSuite app. Um, it's just that when you have a client that needs something like that, you're forced to learn and you're forced to find tools and adapt. So if you're new or if you're still starting out, I, I will still say just take whatever that comes in. As long as you're comfortable and you're sure that you can deliver, take it on. 
But as you start growing, you realize certain things that you don't like to do. Um, so I didn't like all the web apps thing. I didn't like the whole database stuff. I just wanted to do marketing sites and I wanted it to be beautifully designed, interactive, fun, um, that sort of thing. Um, so I think up until maybe six months ago, if you asked me what was my ideal customer, I have no idea. But now it's very clear, like we want companies who want to do marketing websites and only marketing websites on Webflow. Um, the budget is like 10 to 20, 25K. That's the range. Sector, finance, education, ad tech, that sort of area. Anything, as long as it sort of covers the first two criteria, we'll take it on. So it just helps you sort of focus on what you want to do and sort of attract those clients. If your portfolio has everything, most people aren't going to hire you. Even if I'm looking to work with someone and if their portfolio says I do everything from design to web flow to 3D and everything, I'm just like, yeah, no, I'll just, I'll just close it. I'll go to Swerve. someone else. Yeah. Yeah. So I think it's like trying to niche down, but not too niche to the point where it's like, I only do marketing websites for just this specific sector. Sometimes it works, but I think it's still a bit too small. And especially if you're starting out, you're probably not going to get many clients through it. Um, so it's sort of slowly niche it down based on your needs. Yeah. I've heard the advice that you don't choose the niche, the niche chooses you to a certain extent. Like, yeah, essentially, if you're rubbish at whatever, you know, the thing is that you're trying to do, well, then you shouldn't do more of it. You won't be able to get more of it because you yeah. just had a terrible client experience that's not going to recommend you for a web app. And as yeah. a result, like it kind of is decided for you to a certain extent. But it's interesting that you said six months ago, you wouldn't have actually known who your ideal client is. How were you getting clients before? if you don't mind me asking. I think before uh, I was getting them through the Webflow um, showcase, that was a pretty good place early on. A lot of agencies were going through that and they were finding some of the clonables that I was doing. And um, that was one way I got a lot of work, especially from agencies and stuff like that. Um, I got some through LinkedIn. Again, early on, I think there's not too many people on LinkedIn doing Webflow work. So a lot of agencies were reaching out through LinkedIn and I got a couple of projects through that. And then I think referrals were a huge one. So I worked with a the client, they then recommended their friend, work with them. That, those were the three main ways. Now it's slightly different, mostly it's through organic search. Um, so through Google, we get most of our leads from referrals. Again, I think they went from third to second place. Um, a lot of clients just pass on details to their friends or someone else that they work with and then i think finally comes from like linkedin and twitter but it's very small interesting okay that's really really good to know i mean it sounds like you've just done a critical mass of work that you've created as a kind of marketing referral army who are just going out and talking about you and then you know it gets easier and easier maybe to just get yeah. consistent work from that group of people but interesting to hear that the, the webflow showcase was a really good lead source at the start also important to note that the leads you were getting were agencies as well like this is such an underrated or undervalued idea i think like you know partnering with different agencies as you're starting out you know yeah. there might be an agency that doesn't have a depth of skill set in whatever you do you don't need new clients like individual companies necessarily like agencies you can white label you know you can you can collaborate there's projects that you can pitch for together um, as well yeah. like there's so many different ways to kind of skin a cat to use the weirdest phrase i could have possibly come up with there tell me about failure number three taking too long to understand the retainers aren't that bad oh yeah this one i think i was doing like a projection model of the company for the last 12 months and only starting like january we started pitching for retainer projects and starting to put that on the website um, just to give some context when i was freelancing I didn't like retainer projects because one, it feels a bit boring. Like you're just doing the same thing for the same person. It just wasn't like creatively engaging for myself. And the second thing was this very hard to, because whenever you say retainer, they're like, how many hours? What's the cost? Am I going to, what if I don't use these hours? It's just so much of that faff I don't want to deal with. And I, and I had maybe two or three in the retainer model, but it just didn't work out. Always ended up being a terrible um, client. Um, so I just was like, you know what? No client work, no retainer work, zero. The first two years was just like one-off projects, which I thought they were doing fine. But I think this year we realized, you know what? Let's just give it a try. Just because I don't like it doesn't mean someone else wouldn't like it. Especially with when you're hiring, you have people to work on it. Most of them are fine with it. It's just, it was like a personal thing for me and I didn't want it to affect the company. So I we had this one lead come through for like a maintenance work. 
And I was like, you know what, let's 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 try it. And I tried the unlimited model with like no hours or anything like that. It's just you pay us every month. This is all you get. Um, and you get a developer, Slack updates, all that good stuff. I realized my annoying, the annoyance I had was that sort of tracking hours, updating them of like, how many hours did we use and sort of billing for that. I was like, nope, no hours. If you trust us, we'll get it done. Whether it takes five minutes or five hours, doesn't doesn't matter, we'll get it done. Um, so we closed that. And immediately again, my mind just switched on to that idea of like, okay, this works. Like all I need is maybe a couple of clients on a retainer model. And I don't need to be so stressed about closing projects every every single month. Since then, we have, I think, about four or five retainer clients that one helps hiring because now you have this recurring income. You can then be comfortable enough to go and be like, hey, do you want to work with us? We'll pay you this amount. You deal with this client and that client. The second one is every one-off project that comes on or any lead that comes on, I don't have the pressure to like, I need that project this month. Otherwise, you have no money. It comes like the retainer model just works and pays for the third itself. thing I also literally yeah and, and the third thing is if you are building an agency that you want to sell retainers are the the way to go like otherwise your company does not have anything consistent sellable. cash flow yeah consistent cash flow there's no value to it you're just self employed or you just have a job that high paying job whereas if you want to exit the industry if you want to sell the company. You need something that they can buy most of the time, which is the client projects or the retainers or the contracts that you have. Oh, interesting. So they're kind of buying their contracts rather than buying the yeah. agency SOPs or whatever. You know, they're like Yeah, because buying. I know someone else who had their agency acquired and I'm, I'm always wondering, like, what did they even acquire? It's just cash. Uh, you know, all the projects were one off at that point for me. I was like, why would anyone buy it? Like, you could just get your own clients and do it unless you have... And then I thought, okay, maybe products were an IP. Maybe they will buy that. But then there's also like, why would they buy the whole company? Why not just that one product? But yeah, I think if you, if that's the plan, or if you want to build a lot of value for the company, it's this retainer models. But that's more on the business side, I think. That's really, really interesting to to note though, because I, I didn't actually consider that being a big factor in the decision making process of someone buying an agency or not. Let's just bring this back to, you know, the Webflow freelancer that might be listening though. So retainers. Let's say, you know, you work with a client, you really enjoy working with them. Is that when you might say, look, by the way, I offer a retainer package. I have three different packages. One is I'll do 10 hours a month, 20 hours a month, 30 hours a month, or like how should they maybe start thinking about that? And also follow up question, if a client is going to Webflow, they're probably going to Webflow because they want to manage the website themselves. So what are they even offering to like justify a retainer price? Yeah. So I used to think like that, like I will build a website, I'll teach them how to do it and they will do it. But we forget to realize that most, at least small, medium businesses do not have dedicated teams for websites. It's usually one person, one marketing person doing everything. Um, and then you quickly realize, oh shit, even if they have a website that they can edit, they want, they don't have the time to do it. It's always at the lowest priority. Um, and second, they probably don't have that skill of knowing the web. Like they can add blogs, they can tweak stuff. At best, they can, you know, make a page, but they don't know what else to do with the website, how they can grow the website which is something I, I realized very late. It's like, if you imagine if you knew how to do, I'm just trying to think of parallel, like social media marketing, you could watch a couple of videos and you could be trained on doing it, but you wouldn't do it as well as someone who know, who does that as their job. Um, or like ads or SEO, for example. Like we can do a good enough job, but if you have someone full, like on a retainer who does only SEO, their whole job is to get your website ranking for keywords. They will suggest blog posts, they'll suggest keywords to use, all that stuff. Same thing with like the Webflow stuff. If let's say you have a company, let's say about like a 50 people companies, relatively small, they probably have maybe like one manager, marketing manager or head of marketing. And that person probably has no time to deal with the website. Um, they will have, they want to do a new website because they probably get hired or the old website sucks. But then once you give them the new website, they probably wouldn't they add in a blog here and there but they're not going to grow that website they're not gonna, they're not thinking about conversion optimization not thinking about seo that's when your services could come in you can show them like okay you have a new website but these are the steps that you can do to 
help it rank on Google, help convert more users to buy your product. Here are some extra pages that we think could help you with retention time or how we can opt, like that sort of thing really helps. And that's the value that they see. Okay. Even large, yeah. Go on. Can I just ask you then, so what you're really yeah. saying is it's like if you give a child a car, they might have a Porsche in their front drive. They don't know how to drive it and vice versa. So then once you've delivered them the actual website itself, then what you're really selling is how do we make this website really work for your business rather than I'm going to do five website pages a month for you. It's like, well, no, because that's not actually what is they need. Yeah. Yeah. That's not necessarily what they need. Like they can add blog posts themselves, but the real help that you can provide is knowledge of the web, i.e. how to make that content work from a business perspective. Think about like email pop-ups. How does that integrate with MailChimp or whatever, you know, like all that stuff. Is that what you're really saying? Exactly. Yeah. Even, even large companies where they have a whole marketing team they are very good at creating marketing content but most of them do not want to go into webflow start adding pages they just rather give it to someone else who does it at half the time and most of the time they have the budget for it so as long as you can negotiate or understand what they're looking for i think retainer models are like the best way to sort of keep clients on it's just making sure you're adding value and trying to just say like oh we do five pages 40 hours a week most of the time it's very hard to sell it but if you reframe it in like you have a website you have a team but if you need any technical bills or if you want to build like for example we we we, ha- we are working with a retainer client they they have a marketing team but they work on the product side so they design the products they build the products and they market the product they do not have time to deal with the website so they hire us and we only deal with their products so we design the landing pages they give us the content they give us screenshots and everything we design the landing pages, we build it for them. And they will have some idea like, oh, what if, you know, the pricing section, they have like different tiers based on what the user clicks on, show show them a case study that matches that pricing. I'm going to say, okay, yeah, sure. That's something that they can think of, but they can't execute. So then they hire you and they pay you to execute all of their, their marketing ideas. Okay, I feel like we need a whole other podcast on retainers <laughs> or just like, because there's so many different it's, things to ask. Yeah, it's insane hey. how much... Your brain sort of changes once you have that. One thing that I've had just off the back of talking to you throughout this podcast and hopefully other people listening have as well is like a mindset shift and how fundamental that initial being like, no, 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 I'm really hesitant to do that to why don't we just try it out and see if it works. And then objectively, we can decide whether it's right for us or not, like off the back of a trial project. I think that's something that I need to do a lot more in my um, freelancing. Like the whole unlimited subscription model, I... I was like the number one like hater. <laughs> yeah, Dude, I, like, I saw a talk flow episode <laughs> of you bashing it. So yeah. yeah, actually I remember this a couple of years ago because I was it was yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. That's so funny. Not even a couple of like uh, up until I think January, I still had the same mindset. I'm like, I always go back and forth. I'm like, I see the pros, but I also see the cons. I was like, mm, I don't see it working. Why would anyone do it? And I think at one point I was like, screw it. Like, what's the worst thing that can happen? Nobody buys it. Like, it's not the end of the world. I can just delete the page. So I just put it on the website. I didn't promote it or anything. But clients have this way to find things that they need. So they found that page. They go through the plans and they were like, oh, I see that you're doing this unlimited thing. Do you want to chat about it? I'm like, yeah, sure. Again, my mindset switched. Yeah, it's just a retainer model, but without the time thing. Um, So instead of saying it's going to cost you $2,000 a month for 60 hours or 40 hours or something like that. You just scrap that and you just tell them like, as long as he uses, we'll keep working with you and it doesn't matter what task that you give us on. Um, there is a risk of, I think that was why I didn't want to do it. Clients could take advantage of it. They pay the 2000 and try to squeeze everything out of you. But then working with like all these clients, nobody does that. And if they do, all you, you can just be like, you know what? We can't do this. Give them money back and move on, right? Like, so that, again, that's the worst case scenario. But so far it hasn't happened. Most of them understand like, even if they put 10 tickets or whatever, they don't expect you to get all 10 done in one day. They have one month. So we we explain to them like priorities, anything that's high priority, we try to get it done as quickly as possible. Design will take some time, but again, we try to work as fast as we can. Um, If there's anything that you need us to do quickly, just trying to communicate all of this with them really helps. But yeah, now I'm just 
full on unlimited subscription. Oh man, you're going to be doing a video with you in a Porsche. Hey guys, <laughs> uh, I just finished you, my Michael. course. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, I'm excited to see that, see that course. Only 10 grand, 50% off today, 24 hours. Uh, sorry for any American listeners, but generally they are American, those videos that I see. Okay, we need to wrap up because I've taken too much of your time already. Final question. This is the hardest question. Are you ready? Yeah. What is your next failure going to be? I don't know, actually. If I were to make a guess, I would probably say something in the client space, like the project management phase or like trying to manage clients. Because at this, like right now we are at, quite at a capacity like i'm quite full with work so i'm always scared of like, shit what if i'm not managing expectations or the client's not seeing the value that they paid for or whatever and so if there's a failure that i could possibly see it's probably that like the quality drops or something like that but hopefully it doesn't it won't it won't i back <laughs> you you know you've got uh what does it say six projects every quarter so you've kind of set a cap on the amount yeah. of projects that you take on you've got a clear and clear idea about who you want to work with the type of work you want to do you've got enough projects under your belt that you can deal with any problem you've got your own products to deal with the own problems i mean come on you've Another got yourself one, yeah. you've got it you've got this i back you no but this Thank has you. been an incredible episode i feel like tons and tons of quite specific value on very different problems throughout the kind of webflow lifespan or the webflow you know freelancer to agency owner lifespan and I, i'm really excited to see how you grow and develop over the rest of this year and beyond but thank you so thank much you. for coming on webflow podcast and sharing as vulnerably as you have no problem it was, it was really fun like trying to talk all of this usually it's just in my mind i just tell it to myself it's just nice to put it out there maybe therapy would help <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks so much, Fem. No problem. Thank you.